Oh, sorry. <laughs>
Jack convinced a repco to look after the engines. In fact, the young fellow to the left, Michael Gaskin, was one of the organisers of that meeting last weekend. Mike these days is probably about 80, fit man. In those days, he was the pretty boy of repco, the most handsome of all the fellows over there. So in any and all of the PR photographs, you tend to see Mike's happy, smiling face, at least if he focused on other things there. So the segue to the, to the first Repco Bradham RB620 engine is that Jack, after a period of time, thought the FPF is coming to the end of its useful life. We need a cost-effective alternative. And he came upon the notion of using a production block to build a race engine. His concept was a production block, single cam, two valve. And that's essentially the story that he sold to Helen, and more importantly, Dave McGrath, his patron, then the CEO of Repco. That first photograph, the bit that I didn't say, um, that's, in Doonside, that's in Richmond, Doonside Street, Richmond. Uh, most of you would know Victoria Gardens, you Melbournians, Doonside Street runs behind Victoria Gardens. The first, I think, two Repco Brabham V8s were built in that plant as well, and then they moved over to the other side of town in Maidstone. You still go up uh, Doonside Street, there's a Deco building on your right. Can't remember the products that are in that building, but that is one of the two or three factory Repco subsidiaries that were in that particular part of Melbourne. Repco's HQ, Russell Manufacturing, where the whole thing started is about 500 metres from here in that Queen direction, Street. Harry? Queensbridge Street. So here are Oldsmobile F85 blocks being machined in Maidstone to create that RB620 engine. Lots of the componentry were bespoke, but the block itself was a cast off production project by GMH. Repco bought 30 of these blocks from memory and they were used over the following two or three years. That is engine E1, RB620E1, the very first engine being run on the dyno in Dudeside Street in March or April 1965. It's an easy engine to pick because it was the only one that was fitted with Weber carbs, which were famously borrowed by Big Steel, whose uh, operation was a couple of kilometres up the road. E1 still exists. It's owned by one of the Repco engineers, David Nash, who was at the session last weekend. There's Jack in BT19 winning the French Grand Prix in 1966. Famously, as most of you would know, the first man to win a race in a car bearing his own name. Three blokes have done that. Bradham, Dan Burney and Bruce McLaren. That shot is at Monza in 1966 and the dude in the britches and the braces is Enzo Ferrari. And he's looking at that car and going, oh my God, why does that little thing with a single overhead cam and two valves delivering 295 brake horsepower go so damn fast? The answer was a whole lot of things, including a lot less weight than his cars had. Having said that, that weekend a Ferrari did win Ludovico's Scarfiotti came home first. So we're now rolling into 1967. The drivers in 67 were Denny Holm and Jack Brabham. Denny won that year. That shot is of Denny, I think it's Spa. The engine is the so-called RB740, which is their own Brand new engine in 1967, new block, not the F85, Repco bespoke block, Repco bespoke heads between the V exhaust to trim the airstream and make the car slide through the air better. The chassis itself was brand new too. BT24, Ron Toranax, only second brand spanking new uh, Formula One car. The first was the BT3, the cars that followed were derivations of that. This one is to show BT24 in a later life. To be honest, I haven't researched who the driver is yet, but that shot is of Kyle Lamy in South Africa in 1967 or 1968. But it just gives you an idea of what the 67 car looked like. 
It's often said that Brabham and Toranac were very conservative people, but they were also prepared to have a go. He shot us at Monza in 1967, the big tall dude to the right uh, behind the, the uh, left rear of the car's Dan Gurney, wandering up to see his old boss to find out how the thing's going. It's Dan's eagle over there on the left. So the concept there was to try and improve the streamlining of BT24 to get more top speed on circuits that require that. Jack and Ron did have a go. They, they were not this. They were conservative sometimes, but not always. This uh, attempt didn't work. Jack had parallax era in terms of being able to place the car in corners. So they didn't. Pers they pursued this in a couple of Formula Two races and ditched it. Though after this meeting at Monza, they had about 330 brake horsepower that year. The Cosworth DFE that came out that May. I had 400, 405. So 1967 represented a completely different challenge for them. The Cosworth DFE, as I said, arrived in, in May 1967. It would have won that year had it been reliable, but it wasn't. So Jack and Denny had a reliable car. In 1967, there were only two DFE engine cars being the Team Lotus entries. But at the end of that year, Ford said to Colin Chapman, we're going to sell these engines to others, we're going to destroy Formula One. So um, Chapman of Lotus allowed the agreement he had to be breached or withdrawn and the engines were made not, a, not as a free-for-all, but there were two, two, uh, two at Lotus, two at McLaren, one or two depending upon the meeting, to Matra and the fellow that I've missed off there is Joe Sifford, Rob Walker's driver who had a, a Lotus 49. So the Ford Cosworth DFE at that point had 405, 410 brake horsepower, whereas our um, RB740 had only 330 brake horsepower. So they knew they had to do something special in 1968 because the whole light and simple notion just wasn't going to work one more time. Um, the other thing was by that stage, the Ferrari V12 and the BRM V12, by that stage, BRM had ditched the H16, were also looking to be a threat as well. That's the, the Lotus 49, Sun Void in 1967, that's the Cosworth DFE, you probably all know it, 155 Grand Prix wins, greatest Grand Prix engine ever, full stop. So what were they to do? They tried two approaches. One was a radial valve three litre V8 and the other a conventional four valve three litre V8. Repco's paradigm, as I said a moment ago, had been uh, very simple engines to that point. Those engines were, uh, the valve trains were uh, chain driven. This time around they were looking at gear driven valve trains. I'm not an engineer, but the, the radial valve approach is fundamentally around disposing the valves in the combustion chamber to maximise their size. But in reality, or well not in reality, what happens is you get a, um, a spaghetti of inlet and exhaust tracks because you multiply the number of them by two. So that BMW four-cylinder engine looks relatively simple. Um, it didn't ever win a Formula 2 race, but it, it went okay. Repco's solution ended up being incredibly complex. That shop was actually taking, taking and shifting gear about five years ago. Nigel Tate actually owns that e engine. It's called the Repco 850. It's their three litre radial valve V8. And you can easily see the degree of difficulty in installing that engine in a frame both in terms of its bulk and the exhaust systems that somehow need to weave their way around the chassis of the particular racing car. And in the case of Brabham's, they are a space frame chassis, multi-tubular space frames rather than sheet aluminium monocoques. I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but it's it said that um, 
at Ron Tour and I did say, don't even think, Frank Hallam, about putting that engine in my chassis because it can't be done. In fact, it could be done if the engine was designed well. But that car there is a Ferrari Dino 206 of 1969, which has a radial valve V6 engine. And the only reason I include the shot is to prove that a, okay, four cylinder simple, this is a V engine, it can be installed in a chassis effectively if the job's done well. Repco, rep, the design of that particular Repco engine was not particularly good. The, the, the political element to this, if you like, is that Frank Helm is the general manager of Repco Brabham engines. The 66 engine was Phil Irving's engine. The 67 engine was Norm Wilson's engine, who's still alive. Helm didn't have his name on an engine. Helm wanted to have his name on an engine. He should be applauded for pursuing the unfair advantage. We won two, we won two world, world titles. We needed to do something special. Other manufacturers were looking at these Apfel Beck type heads. He did the right thing by pursuing the option. What he did wrong was to pursue it far too long. He was a senior guy. He was trained as a mechanic. He was not an, an engineer. He pursued it far longer than he should have done. Norman Wilson wrote that in Frank Helen's book. So the problem was by the time they abandoned the thing, having not been able to get it to work, we were in November 1967. You know, the, the, the season's not that far away. So they started the development of what it was a conventional engine way too late. Conventional in the sense that it was cross flow, Four, 32 valve, four valve, twin overhead cams, gear driven. Same layout as the Ford Cotsworth DFE. But it was a more complex engine that they'd done in the previous two years. The, the other big difference other than timing compared with the 1966 and 67 engines is that they, both engines had been finished early. The 620 engine, did two Tasman series races at Longford and Sandown. It did the 66 South African non-championship Grand Prix and a couple of non-championship Formula One events before they got going in Europe, okay? It did take till France, as we said earlier, to have the first race win. In 1967, Repco went absolutely for, uh, to broke, or for broke, in the Tasman series, they ran a two-car team, and in fact the car that, um, where's the fellow from the National Museum, that Repco Brabham that's just been bought by the National Museum, uh, BT23A, is, is Jack's car from 67. But the point is, two cars did eight races in the Tasman series in 1967, and two or three non-championship events before the Grand Prix season. They'd done the equivalent of a Grand Prix season, before they got to the Grand Prix. Do you reckon the engines were reliable? You bet you they were. So in 68, we were going in cold. They were finished late, they hadn't been developed, they hadn't spent enough time on the dynos, let alone in the car and running out of time. In Frank Helen's defense, so he made a wrong call on timing. In Frank, Frank Helen's defense though, he had other commercial pressures upon him. By that stage, there were quite a few customer Repco V8s uh, spread about the place and all those dudes expected their engines to be maintained. In, you know, Jack was a, Jack loved money. You know, I, I copped a dose of this um, last weekend in talking to the Repco engineers. You know, he knew the value of a dollar. He wanted to make a dollar. He wanted to make a start at India in 1968, two cars, him and Rent. Um, so, Hallam also had the challenge of developing a 4.2 version of the V8, the so-called 760, which would run on methanol at Indianapolis. Frank Maddich was planning on running in the Can-Am series with the Maddich SR4, which is the car that Nigel Tate owns, in 1968. The car wasn't finished till 69. But Hallam also had the challenge of creating another engine for the US. That was a 4.8 liter variant of a 760. 
Repco were looking to do commercial work, so they were looking at doing a special cylinder head for that Volvo coupe thing at the time. Who cares what, what it is? But that was another project that he didn't need to deal with. To give you some idea of the head count, 59 according to Helen's book in May 1968. So it's not a lot of dudes given the number of projects that they actually had running. So they were in trouble before the season got underway. That's a picture of Maddich um, in the SR4 in 1969. Don't really know why I put that there. So the 1968 Formula One season, the pairing was Jack and Jochen Rink. Jochen won his title in 1970. Absolutely the fastest guy on the planet at that particular stage, probably about 25. The Brabham BT26 with the chassis, which was another cracker from Toronac, he never built um, a bad car. It was sort of a semi-monocoque, a space frame with the, the, the frame reinforced by sheet aluminium. But at the start of the season, Jack had an each-way bed. The 860 engine was underdeveloped, so uh, they ran Jochen in a BT24. Last year's car, but they didn't have one. Jack had sold the cars at the end of the season off to South Africa, so when he actually wanted to use one, they had to quickly knock together a BT24 for Jochen. So, so Rink was running in a simple car from 67 at the start of the season, whilst Jack sought to get reliability out of the new 860. And that's a picture of a beautiful little thing. I'm not sure actually what that race is, but you look at that engine, those of you that are familiar with the DFE will see the similarities of the layout. The car produced somewhere around 400 brake, brake horsepower as a peak during that season, which as you'll see in a moment, was more than competitive power. That's a comparison shot between the BD24, the 67 car, which is on this side of it. Um, it's being driven by Dan Gurney there in the Dutch Grand Prix. And the dude on the inside in car five is Jack in BT26. The other thing that was being, was a big challenge for all designers in that season of 19, 68 was wings. 68 was the year of the wing, the first year of the wing in Formula One. Um, I think, or not I think, I know that Brabham and Ferrari appeared with wings together at, at the first Grand Prix. I'm just not sure which Grand Prix it was actually in. So not only is Jack dealing with all of these engineering problems related to the engine, but also pursuing wings to maintain the performance of the car. That's running, running wingless at Monza during practice. It's actually in Jack's car in September. And that shot is at Mont Tremblant in Canada towards the very end of the season. Compare the wings, the, the big wings on both the front and back of the car with the little ones that he was running a little bit earlier in the season. So in amongst fiddling with wings though, there is absolute mechanical carnage in those engines. There's not time to go through all that now, but you can, you can do it at, at your leisure if you can be bothered. Um, the, the story of the season is over in the right-hand column. The only um, race winners that year were Cosworth DFE engine cars, with the exception of Jackie Hicks's win in a V12 Ferrari, a Ruan, it's Ruan, not Rovin, P-A, you back right, right, never mind. Um, there were all sorts of mechanical dramas though. Some of them were preparation failures. Some of them were component problems. I'm trying to regain my, my thought processes here. So the, the fundamental problem with the engine was torsional vibration in the valve train. Cosworth had exactly the same problem with the DFE in 1967 and solved it. All it was going to take was a little bit more development um, by Repco to solve the problem for the following season. Just park that thought for a moment. But the engine, so you may look at the, the 860 design and go, really, it was a failure. And it actually was a failure in Formula One. The point that I didn't make, which is now in my head now, is in that 68 season, 
Rink was on the front row in three different races. He was on pole, I think it's twice, yeah, twice. So the point to be taken there is that the car, you know, the car had speed, the engine had power, it just didn't have reliability, okay? It wasn't, wasn't a dog, it wasn't a clunker. The RB760, which is the tall block variant of the same engine design, won the 1969 Australian Sports Car Championship. Frankly, that's not a big deal because the cars that he beat didn't represent a particularly strong field. But Peter Revson's win in the Indian IndyCar race at the Indian, Indianapolis Raceway Park road course as against the Speedway, which is two 100 mile heats, was a win of real significance because he was running against the best in the US, including Unza and Andretti and all of the heroes of the time. It's unfortunate though that that particular race ended up being the very last race in the commercial relationship uh, between Brabham and, uh, and Repco. That shot is of Jack's Indianapolis car in 1969, and we have time to dwell on that. That's a sports car engine on the back of the SR4. So, unfortunately, the failures in 1968 had some major consequences. I'll get there. So, Jack needed a Formula One winner, and all he had to do to get a Formula One winner was to buy a Ford DFE and put it in the back of his existing design, which is what he decided to, to, uh, to do. Without doubt, RB60 was a DFE rival. When I spoke to Norman Wilson three years ago, he said, well, what, you know, what, you, what would you have done? He said, we would have fixed the design, the valve train problem exactly the same way Cosworth did, strengthen the block to allow the engine to be used as a stress member, exactly as the Cosworth was. And I mentioned the valve train thing. From Repco's point of view, Harriet and I were talking about this last night, their global marketing goals have been met. They've been in Formula One for three years. They've been in Australian racing for the same period of time. They've won two world championships and they promoted the hell out of it. They didn't promote the hell out of it nearly as well as Lotus and Ford did, mind you. Formula One was getting more costly. The changes in Repco senior management are, are code words for Sir Charles McGrath was easing out as being chairman of the company. The CEO was changing as well. Can't remember the, 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 the names of the individuals involved. Doesn't matter. The point is that the people that have been supporters of the project were changing. The Repco Brabham engine project never broke even. Repco somewhat expected the company to do that. That was never going to happen unless they sold engines. They were expecting Jack to sell the engines. It wasn't in Jack's interest to sell engines. The only thing Jack was interested in was Jack, which is the way a Formula One driver should be. As long as he had an engine that could win him races, he wasn't interested in Redco's commercial ends of selling engines in volume. So Jack and Sir Charles McGrath had a very simple man-to-man -man private conversation and spoke about where they were respectively at and in a very dignified kind of a way, the project came to an end. But Repco's involve, involvement in racing didn't end there because they saw a much more cost-effective option of building an engine for Formula 5000. So they're transitioning out of Formula 1 and putting theirs and Holden's uh, weight behind Formula 5000 as an option. It was a big political debate within Australia at the time about whether we'd go two litre, four valve, four cylinder or Formula 5000. As soon as Holden and Ripco put their weight behind Formula 5000, game, set and match. So Ripco wore away again, but they were able to promote themselves much more cost effectively because 5000 was a production based engine formula. RDEs went on winning in Australia for 20 years, you know, really well into the 80s when I was running Formula V and even Formula Ford, you occasionally see Repco V8 engine Remaxes and Elfins winning in national racing. And of course, there's still a few of them running in the uh, historic era today. 
there's, uh, there's Jack, that one's actually taken in 1970, his last year as a driver, and he does look to have, both, he both looks his age in that shot, and he looks to have a few things on his mind. Thank you.